is correct. Now, you can use different options to answer these multiple choice questions. So you can, there's an option of uh, elimination. Eliminate what you feel is wrong, and then you'll be left with the correct answer. Oh, if you know what is going on, just go straight to the correct answer and then suck what is left. Okay. So the question tells us that a car is moving at a constant velocity. It's even in bold. Which of the following statements about the forces acting on the car is correct? One, the net force acting on the car is zero. Two, there are no forces acting on the car. The weight of the car is equal to the normal force acting on the car. And then there is a non-zero net force acting on the car. Wow. So one thing we know is that for as long as a car is moving at a constant velocity, which means the V final is the same as the V initial. Let's start with option number one. They're telling us that the net force, how do we calculate net force? F net is equal to MA. Okay. And we know that M is the mass. This is the acceleration. So literally, for as long as the velocity is constant, there is no change that is happening within the velocity. So which means our acceleration is going to be zero. We know that acceleration is given as the change in velocity over the change in time. Yes, time will be there, but then the change in velocity is going to give us a zero. So for as long as the acceleration is zero, which means the net force is also zero. So I feel like this option is the correct option. Okay, so I already have a correct option. So these ones, there are no forces, that's wrong. I mean, there's always a force that must push the car forward. Okay, and then there's always friction that must try to bring the car down. And then the weight of the car is equal to the normal force. That is acting on the car. I mean, this is okay, this is true. But then we're talking on a car that is, we're talking about a car that is moving. This is possible if the car is stationary and there's nothing else. And then there is a non-zero net force. No, this is wrong because we say it, the net force is a zero. So option A would be the best suited for that. And then 1.2, a pole is projected vertically upwards. We ignore resistance. Which of the following statements about acceleration of the ball at its maximum is correct? Statements about acceleration is correct. So we know that as long as the ball is projected back upwards, there is just one acceleration, which is G. It's more like um, the influence is just gravitational but then which direction? So gravity just acts downwards, regardless of the position of the ball. So acceleration is zero, no, this is out. G, now that the acceleration is G and then it's directed downwards, which is the correct direction and speed. G directed upwards, no, G directed horizontally, no. G will always be directed downwards. Whether the object was vertically up or vertically down, regardless of the initial direction, of projection. Then 1.3, we have a graph that is not to scale, the relationship between the gravitational force and then the mass and its distance. Okay, so this is the distance, this is the force. Now they are telling us that the magnitude of the force at a distance r is f. Which of the following statements is correct? for the magnitude of the force X. Okay, so at if the distance is now six times bigger. So what do you suggest? Okay. So from the universal law of gravitation, M1, M2 divided by R squared, so we know that if it is R, just capital R, this is going to be the force because F is going with capital R. Now, what if we increase this 
to six. So that's gonna be G M one M two over six R but squared. So we know that six squared is going to give us um thirty six R squared. So if I exclude this, okay, I will be left with just one over thirty six F. So this whole thing represents F. So one over thirty six F should be the correct option. Now that's the force. For as long as you increase the distance, the force must also decrease. So D is the best option for this. Then ball M, moving at a speed V to the right, collides with a stationary ball N on the smooth surface. Immediately after collision, ball M comes to rest. And then N moves to the right with a speed V. Which of the following about the collision is correct? One, total momentum is conserved, and then the masses are unequal. So the first statement is correct. Okay, but then how do we tell about the masses? The fact that the speeds are the same after and before, because this is, one is at rest, the other one is moving with me. After the collision, this one loses the velocity and then just goes to rest and then this one moves off. So there's no way that the masses are unequal. There has to be something unique. Chances are high that the masses are the same because it's more like looking at balls of equal masses. And then this one carries the same velocity or carries a velocity V. And then this one just transfers the velocity to that one. And then this one moves off with the velocity. So the masses have to be the same for the velocity to be the same. So total kinetic energy is conserved and the masses are unequal. Mm -mm. This is not making sense. I'm not at peace with it. I don't know. I'll see. Let's see. Total momentum and total kinetic energy are conserved and then the masses of the balls are equal. I'll go with C. Why? Because of the masses being equal but also D has masses being equal. Okay, total momentum is conserved and total kinetic energy. So what sort of collision is this? It definitely has to be elastic collision. Why? Because it's going to be M1B plus zero is equal to M2V plus zero. So. Momentum will be constant. What about the EK? Same story with the EK. It's going to be M1 V squared, and that's going to be M2 V squared. Now, as long as the masses are the same, it means so C is the best option. Because this one is telling us momentum conserved, kinetic energy is not. So C is the best. Then 1.5, a small stone is dropped from rest and undergoes free fall, which of the following below shows the correct gravitational potential, V, and so on. A stone is dropped from the rest and that goes free fall. So we know that with the energy, uh, if it is at the highest point, it's going to have EP max. And then at the bottom, when where it reaches the ground or the surface, it's going to have EK max. So if it's EP max, this is going to be EK minimum. Now that I say zero. Then if it's EK maximum, then EP will be minimum. So EK, okay, both graphs, that is that, starting from there, going that side, which is okay. This one and that, which is still fine. Makes sense where the graphs are starting from. This and that, okay, this and that, that is also fine. So all the graphs represent the correct orientation of the EP max and the EK minimum and so on and so forth. Now let us look at some other aspect, okay? So how will these graphs look like? So chances are high. These graphs are not going to be straight lines because the change that is happening within the energy 
is not uniform. So I'm going to cross this. I'm going to cross this out because it has a straight line. Let me just focus on just these two. Okay. So if the energy is being lost from the EP, is it going to be this much or this sharp? In other words, is it going to be an inverse proportion? Chances are high it won't. Is the EK going to increase exponentially? Which is correct. So we can see that these two have the same type of graphs. Actually, one, two, three. The EK is just the same. So the issue is for us to highlight the correct E, E. So I'll go with option C for number five. Then 1.6, the stationary passenger at a railway station listens to a train approaching at constant speed. So this is the play effect. Which of the following is correct for the sound of the approaching train that is heard by the listener? Okay. So for as long as the source is approaching, we expect the listener to get the most, the loudest sound. Okay, and if the sound is the loudest, which means it has to be a higher pitch. And for as long as the pitch is high, then what, what's gonna happen to the frequency? Let's first look, so this one is out, and then the last option is also out, because so that is lower pitch. Now, the observed frequency, since the source is approaching, should also be more, because you tend to hear more of the noise or the sound. So higher pitch, higher frequency, because pitch is how high or how low a sound note is. Then 1.7 particle P and Q, as well as R, have charge of 2Q, separated by small distance R, which of the following statements below allowed about electrostatic forces, FPR, which P exerts on R and FRP, which R exerts on P is correct. So we're being told particle P has a charge of Q and then particle R has a charge of 2Q. They're separated by this. They want us to tell about the forces between F P R and F R P. Now, without even uh, doing calculations or what? Okay, we can start with that. You know that the force will be K U one U two over R squared. That's K. In this case, we have a Q. We're gonna have a two Q over a distance R squared, so which is two A. Q, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Does it make sense? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. This is relevant. We know that if two bodies are being separated, the forces that will exist between them will be the same, but just in the opposite direction. So FPR must be the same as FRP. So this is out. I'll take this out as well. I need to have the same values. So we have this option and this option. So which one do we take? I'm gonna go for the last option. Why? Because if P is experiencing a force as to Q, let's say the force will be in that direction. And then this one's force will be in that direction. Okay. The forces have to be the same, but opposite. From Newton's third law. Okay, then 1.8. So the same thing applies to universal gravitation. So will be the charges. 1.8 is uh, electricity, battery of EMF of that and that. Negative resistance is an internal what what resistance and so on. So which of the following combination about the ammeter reading will be correct when the switch is closed? Remember ammeter reading is giving us the value of the amount of electricity that is flowing within the entire circuit. Okay, let's look at option A. Ammeter only reads the current in R1. This is wrong. Because remember this, the where the ammeter is located. 
it's going to read the current of the entire circuit, which means this current that is passing through R1 and R2. I don't even need to, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Why am I doing it like that? Let me read nice. They're telling us if the switch is open. Okay. If the switch is open. Will it make any difference? Ameter reads only R1. It's still wrong. Because the moment you open or close the switch, I mean, this there's a connection to R1. It's not a big deal. Only thing is that there is just an alternative path for the electricity to that side or even a short circuit. You know. Okay, so that is wrong because it's just not R1. R2 is part of it because the two tend to be in uh, series. So I can say this whole part is in series with R2. So that is out. We're not going for that. Then ammeter. So this seven is also wrong. Ammeter reads only the current in R2. That is wrong also because it's both. Ammeter reads the current in both R1 and R2, which is correct statement. Let's look at this side. If we close it, if we close this, Ameta reads the current in R1 and R2. No, it's not going to be correct. Because now, the moment you close the switch, there is no resistance here. There is resistance this side. So the current will just go through straight via that channel. So which means the only current or the only resistor to focus on is R2. I don't know, it's what's option for R1 and R2, and then just R2. So option D is the best. 1.9, the direction of an induced current in a coil of a generator depends on dot, 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 dot. The length of the coil, the speed of rotation, direction of the magnetic field, the strength. So this is out. Does that make sense? 1.9 saying it's out. Why am I saying it's out? Because it just stands out compared to the rest. Okay. How does the length influence direction? How does speed influence to doesn't? How does the strength of the field influence? No. So all these ones will just work on the amount of induced current or induced emit. So C the direction of the magnetic field. That will tell us more about the direction of the induced current. Okay, then uh, 1.10, the work function of a zinc is greater than that of magnesium, which of the following statements about threshold frequencies is correct. So remember, threshold frequency is just the minimum frequency needed to eject an electron from the metal surface. So the threshold of zinc is greater 